Thank you. I'm Andre, and uh, you can read about me on the LinkedIn, so we'll save time on that one. I work for Roche Diagnostic, which is a medical device company, uh, regulated industry, pretty interesting one, and this, I know that this title is pretty mouthful, but what it is all about is an example how the new technology can influence the architecture decisions and how we make the architecture decisions and what challenges are there. So the example is pretty interesting because it's applicable to multiple uh, you know, productive environments, not only to clinical laboratories. So what is the need? The need is that we have multiple instruments, like analyzers, big workplaces, uh, in a clinical laboratory, and we have multiple operators. So the operators are not assigned to a particular workplace. They are rotating, they are serving or operating multiple of the workplaces. However, each operator needs to be associated with the interactions on a very specific workplace. Uh, for regulatory reasons, whatever the operator loads on the system, whatever you know, validates on the system, calibrates the system, and so on. This brings challenge because you know, in, for example, uh, southern part of Germany, in one clinicum, the operator, each one, would need to log in by typing username password 200 times per working shift of eight hours, which is annoying, which is cumbersome, which makes them, uh, you know, uh, error prone. So additional <coughs> constraints are, uh, are there that the operators usually have specific uh, lab uh, clothes, like lab coats. They have uh, gloves, which are potentially contaminated with blood and so on. So use of RFID, which we also have patent, and I know that our colleagues from Siemens Health Seniors had also in this context patents, are not so opportune. Therefore, we plan for something else. The technology is approving, uh, uh, improving, so let's use the biometrics. How it works. We have an operator, let's call her Connie, she's somewhere here, and operator <laughs> uh, comes to the laboratory at the morning, goes to any of the workplaces, her picture will be taken, she will be asked for credentials, and then, assuming that she will be authorized and authenticated, she can work with the system A. Later, whenever, she can move to the system B. And then she only touches the uh, uh, touch screen, her picture will be taken, and immediately she can work with the system. Even more, she can take the context of her work from system A to system B. For example, she worked on a specific task, she worked on a specific uh, specimen instance, she can take it to the uh, context, uh, to the workplace B. So that's the need. Now we have obviously the architecture decision making. It starts with what? We are at the you know, Carnegie Mellon SAE conference, starts with quality attributes. So I picked some of them, the more important here. <coughs> The interoperability needs to be for new and old systems. Performance sign on, no, this one with face only within one second. Scalability, we just don't know how it will be adopted in the laboratories. And obviously we have the burst type of uh, workload on certain times of the day and times of the week. And reusability, you know, don't forget, we are not making, Roche is not making money with the uh, user authentication. Therefore, we just need to be quick to the market and with low initial investment. Translating it to some architecture requirements, which means like, for example, no software should be installed on the laboratory system. Uh, technology like HTTPS is the most what is accepted in the laboratory. Event-driven, scalable for workflows, quick to implement, which means a lot of you know, uh, use of components which are available. And this makes even, or leads us to even more harder uh, decisions like, oops, sorry, so too quick, like <clears throat> using only browser, everything in the cloud, serverless functions, and uh, we will use mostly the serverless uh, services provided by the cloud service provider. That was our uh, situation in this case. Now, in general, there is not only one project which we are doing with the serverless, and we try to establish how we are making the decision. By the way, we are not very decisive company. It means to what cloud environment we are going. So we are with AWS, Azure, and Google, and IBM. I think I put it in an alphabetical order. So how we are approaching it? It's actually a <coughs> cutout from another project. When you have, for example, the, uh, the deployment model, 
the exec uh, executable components like ingress uh, data bucket, arriving data check, and transformation queue in this example, we associate with each one very specifically the execution environment. It helps us as a kind of like checklist because then we can, for multiple of the uh, environments, say, okay, that execution environment is realized like here on premises through uh, min IO as uh, three compatible storage uh, containers and RabbitMQ running on Kubernetes. AWS would be S, AWS, uh, S3 storage, Lambda, and SQS, and uh, for Azure, the corresponding components too. We are trying to do this to support the decision making, because obviously then you can check if for all of the execution environments you have the corresponding services from the cloud, or what you need to build, and how much it would cost, and what are the consequences, which one is better where. But this very specific uh, thing helps us. Now, Let's come to the architecture, and this next slide is probably the least uh, important for you because that's the architecture of this beast, uh, and you probably cannot transfer it to your problems, but you can transfer some of the learnings. So that's only to prove that on AWS, and we have the same for Azure, just the AWS have, sorry for Microsoft, they have better looking icons, so therefore I put it here. Uh, that's the new icon set, by the way, from 2019. So I can prove here that everything, like the sign-on website, uh, is running from serverless S3 buckets through CloudFront CDN. We have face identification by the AWS recognition service, which uh, also helps us with, you know, avoiding some potential pitfalls of GDPR. For example, this does not store the photographs, store the, um, the signature, let's say, of it. Um, however, it permits to check make some additional security check. For example, check if our operator Connie got a facelift the, last facelift the last night or whatever, was maybe partying too long. Uh, you can integrate also uh, with other uh, authentication providers via AWS Cognito. That's also very convenient, serverless service. Uh, the entire software are Lambda functions written in Go and it seems to be really snappy and in Python just for most administrative uh, purposes. And we have a lot of other uh, AWS serverless services in this context, like API Gateway, DynamoDB, CloudWatch, CloudTrail, uh, simple email service, and for the voice, um, uh, Lex and Poly. So as you see, within the square, this AWS big square, we from outside don't see any servers. Therefore, therefore it's serverless. Now, obviously, this is the happy picture. There are some challenges behind it. And because this, I think, in my calculation, the seventh talk about serverless during this conference, uh, some of the challenges you have probably heard uh, in, in other talks. So the first one is, uh, well, like the rabbits, there is proliferation of serverless models. Uh, we had the serverless functions, the AWS Lambdas, the Azure functions, the Google Cloud functions. We have the managed container orchestration, like AWS Fargate, the Elastic Container Service, Elastic Container Kubernetes Service, the same practically from Azure with ACS, AKS, and the Azure Container Instances, and so on and so on. We can scale, scale, make scaling of the on-premises Kubernetes cluster to the cloud, which is also kind of serverless, because we say, well, okay, we have today in our cluster, let's say, 20 nodes, and we need probably like 1,000 in bars, so we can use the virtual kubelet on uh, Azure uh, container instances, or so far I know a similar concept to Google Cloud Run. And we have the <coughs> Kubernetes-based serverless. We have heard, you know, like, uh, whatever, half an hour ago, the uh, Fission, uh, about the Fission. We have also the Google Knative, OpenFast, Kubeless. There were on various talks mentioned various of these concepts. And even more. <laughs> we have the lightweight micro VMs, uh, the AWS Firecracker, which is this, what AWS makes open source, which goes as the baseline for Lambdas and baseline for, for Fargate. Pretty interesting concept. You could put like, put like 4,000 of them on one physical machine and uh, run one within 250 milliseconds. So challenge, proliferation of serverless models. Second challenge, cold start. There was a lot of discussions. I don't want to go into the details once again, but it adds every new or additional instance of the service function adds um, some time. There are some workarounds possible. I strongly not recommend them, like keeping functions warm. This is discutable, we can move it to the beer discussion, but I don't recommend it. There is a resolution with this, a serverless trade-off possible. 
like fully managed container orchestration or the serverless on top of uh, container orchestrator, which were presented several times during this meeting. And there is, I think, the hope on the horizon because there is so much discussion about it that the industry needs to find a solution for that. Last uh, group of challenges, maturity of tools and approaches. Well, we have consequences with the serverless functions not being able to look to access the underlying infrastructure, uh, which means we cannot put there something like service mesh, mesh like Istio or Linkerd or something like that. We need to rely on this, what is uh, delivering us the cloud service provider, or a lot of the observation monitoring tools are based on analysis uh, of logs. And there is, I think, a lot of uh, works to be done. In general, serverless is still in its growing pains and we need to look where it is going. There is also low standardization of the services. If you are using your own developed code, then you can probably, with some additional effort, move it between AWS, Azure, and Google. However, if you are starting, like in these examples, using the you know, specific services of the cloud service provider, the recognition, the Cognito, the uh, DynamoDB, and so on, the APIs are very seldom uh, uh, compatible. For S3, you can find even for uh, Azure, compatible libraries, but not for all of the other services. But with the, you know, remark, with the concept of, for example, dealing with execution environment, you can still port your uh, make the architecture portable. Summary, last slide. So in this example, it worked pretty good in terms of fulfilling the initial requirements. However, with the challenges in the context of our, you know, stability, oriented industry, and Felix can probably, you know, nod with your head. That's a very difficult industry. We are very, very reluctant in terms of the immaturity of tools and approaches, uncertainty of quickly developing markets. So it's a lot of on us, on the architecture, not dealing with the challenges of the technology, but rather with convincing our management and stakeholders that it will be accepted. And we are Roche, so we are doing now what patient needs next. Thank you.